If you want to pump your body and expand your mind, there's only one place to go. Mind Pump. Mind Pump. With your hosts, Sal Stefano, Adam Schaefer, and Justin Andrews. In this episode of Mind Pump. Another one. Me, Adam, and Justin, uh, for about 27 minutes, have some good conversation. We talk about my adventure at the biohacking convention or seminar with Justin. Uh, I had a tough time. I was biting Ooh. my lip the oh, whole man. time. Yeah, it was it was fun. It was good times. Yeah. Uh, we talk about Soylent. It's that shitty company <laughs> that tries to sell you the shitty it's product. It's made of people. To people make forgot you about that. Unhealthy. Yeah. Uh, we talk about Aubrey de Grey. Um, he's a longevity expert that unfortunately looks extremely old for his age. Yeah, like a decrepit ZZ Top. We talk about who really benefits from biohacking. Uh, and then we talk about the similarity of between the biohacking community and the muscle building community. There's it's interesting. There's a lot of parallels. There's a lot of crossover. Uh, we also mention our sponsor, Organifi. If you go to OrganifiShop.com and enter the code MINDPUMP, you'll get 20% off any of their products. Uh, and then we get into the questions. The first question was, should anybody be giving nutritional advice or prepping people for competitions if they're not registered dietitians? Mm, my RD prepped me for stage. Yeah, that's why you lost. Yeah, said nobody. Second question was, uh, what are our favorite muscle building meals? Like, what do we have as staples when we're trying to pack on the mass? I eat a horse. On our ass. Yeah. The third question was, what is the point that we finally realize that we're actually not lifting weights to impress women? We're trying to impress the dudes. <laughs> Hey there, guy. Is it working? <laughs> Are you impressed yet? <laughs> the final question was, what is good posture? How can we develop good posture? And why do most people have terrible posture? We talk about Prime and Prime Pro in that particular one. And also, I want to mention this. We have something called our Super Bundle. Now, what the Super Bundle does is it takes a lot of our most popular programs. It, it takes, makes them more super. <laughs> it takes MAPS Anabolic. Maps Aesthetic, Maps Performance, Maps Anywhere, and Maps Prime. And it puts them together in a way that sets you up for basically an entire year of exercise programming. In other words, if you're serious about your fitness, you want to build muscle, you want to burn fat, you want to get yourself to a better place physically, we have we put them all together and organize it in a way to where basically every week is planned out for you with different workouts, different exercises, different adaptation targets. All of the exercises have demos and videos and instructions, so we're helping you along the way. Uh, it's it's a it's probably the most effective way you can get to where you want to go. But what we've done is we've taken all these programs and we all, we've also discounted them substantially. I think it's over thirty percent off, so you don't have to get them all individually. You just get them all together. It's like using the freeway instead of using all these stupid side roads. That's a great uh, you know analogy. I mean? Almost yeah. makes sense. Uh, so the, ramp water, <laughs> the super bundle. Uh, if you're interested in it, go to mindpumpmedia.com, enroll in it, and get your year started off right. You guys got to fill you. me in. Uh, we all divided and conquered yesterday, which I always love when we do that. You got Justin was over at Halo. Sal was over Ruffle and Feathers over <laughs> at uh, <laughs> it's like a bio yeah. the Biohacking Convention, and if I was on the Talk and Jock podcast. So what What? Uh, what happened at the I, – I saw the Mind Pump Media Instagram story, and <sighs> – you had the Soylent guy up there. You had some doctor up like there. Nutribox. box. Yeah. What, so what happened? So uh, Taylor belongs to this this uh, newsletter called uh, Hustle. The Hustle. The Hustle. Mm. And they put together this event with influencers on the biohacking space. In the biohacking right. space, yeah. they call themselves wellness experts. I'm going to tell you something right now. <laughs> They're not fucking wellness. How experts. painful was it to sit there and be silent? So we show up. It's up in San Francisco, and it's first off, great place. We go in, super high security to get up to this like office building. Yeah, and we and it's like you have no control over the uh, elevator. Just so you know, it's yeah, like you step in and it's like they predetermine where you're going. Yeah, you're they like, won't even huh? let you go. We're not. <laughs> we're like, we got lost. We, we did. Like, oh so, shit. So, and it's uh, if you picture what the stereotype of like working in Silicon Valley is like. Yeah. That's what it looked like. Like yeah. we walk in and there's like this big igloo looking thing that people sit in and it's work. It's like a hive. I was like, what yeah. the hell are you guys doing in there? People skating around and all weird. I'm like, oh shit, we're in yeah. like. We're in what people think. Interesting furniture. Yeah. Yeah, like the show. Like Legos, stacking Silicon furniture. Valley, like that yeah. type of deal. We're exactly. All, all the totally. pods. Exactly. So we it go was in. like Hooli. 
Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. totally yeah. like Huli. So we go in there, and there's a, a group of, I don't know, it was like 50 people. Yeah. They're all, the audience is about 50 people, and they're all tech hipsters, like 20-something, 30-something-year-old you know, mm-hmm. dudes all with like- Wow. Without you even telling me, I can already see what's, what's going on here. So you've got these people that know a little bit more information than some techie nerd kid who plugs in and writes code all day long, and they're smart kids, so they're looking for the advantage right. for hacking hacking into harder, better- Everything performance-driven. And so the, you get these people that call are calling themselves wellness people that are Dude. really marketing and probably selling some Dude, shit. Dude, what they're oh looking- Oh my God, how did you bite your tongue? What, what, oh, bro. Oh, so what they're looking for is- in the, cause he's, painful. The questions that these kids were asking were, you can tell they want like, tell me the most cutting edge supplement or thing- yeah. One thing I can do that's going to make me like Steve How Jobs. How can I squeeze out more hours in my day yeah. of productivity? Yeah, but that's also enjoy- by all means necessary. Yeah, by also but also enjoy my life and get eight hours of sleep <laughs> and have great sex and all <laughs> yeah, that stuff. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, so so that's the kind of environment. Nice kids. So we're sitting down, mm. and up at the on the panel was uh, Molly Maloof, who is awesome. Mm-hmm. So she's going to be great. I want to have her on the show. Yeah, she was spitting some fire. Then there was a dude that repre- He was a uh, he used to be a, uh, an engineer, but now calls himself a biohacking wellness expert. Yeah, he's not. No. <laughs> then the guy next to him was yeah, like, like how, what, how, how, what was his like? So his credentials were: I've listened to Dave Asprey for like he a write, year. He writes. <laughs> and, he writes and talks about ketogenic diets. That's it. Yeah. That's and that's the answer to everything, according to him. So he's up there. Then the uh, but he was backpedaling when Molly was fucking shitting on it, which is great. I'll get I'll get into yeah. that for a second. Totally. In, in a second. Then the guy next to him was he used to be the marketing director, if I'm not mistaken marketing director or one of the founding people of Soylent. Oh, wow. Soylent, for the unaware who are listening right now, is a company that created this meal replacement powder that engineers would drink and not eat. Yeah. That way they could stay at their desk and just Gives work. you everything you need to stay alive. Yeah, they advertise it as like perfect nutrition, perfectly engineered nutrition, so you don't need food. All you do is because fuck, you know, food is like it's yeah. such a hassle. Yeah, it takes so much food. time to sit I mean, down and chewing eat. Chewing food, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Like I just want to sit here what and work terrible and be experience. super creative and microdose acid all day. So anyway, yeah. they make this thing that's like perfect nutrition, and that's what you drink, and that's it. So that's the whole thing behind it. And we've talked about it before. Soylent to me is so ridiculous. Uh, if Soylent was a person, I would kick it in the teeth. It's so dumb, right? Yeah. So they're up there and they're answering, they're talking about- Well, explain that to people that are listening that may actually be taking Soylent thinking that it's a good idea, right. why it's not a good idea. Well, I'll tell you what I said. So they're up there and they're answering questions about you know, you know, know, wellness and performance, this and that. And Molly keeps saying things like, look, a ketogenic diet for some people is excellent. Other people have polymorphisms, which cause blood lipids to go all over the place. It's not for them. She's like, I'm one of those people- if I went when I went keto, my blood lipids were all over the place. I do better on a, a more plant based diet, this and that. The keto dude next to hers, you can tell already. He's like, uh, and yeah. he's like, well, how long were you on keto? He's already yeah, trying like to set you're himself probably up. Probably doing it wrong. Exactly, like yeah. you're doing it wrong. She's yeah. like, no, you know, here's the deal. <laughs> then the Soylent guy says his spiel about you know what Soylent was all about, and then they go back to Molly, and she's like, and she's on the panel with them. Remember, she's sitting up there with him. She goes. She goes, I got to be honest, I hate Soylent. She's like, it's horrible. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, she yeah. straight up said that? face is Bro, so great. She goes off on it. And I'm just yeah. like, and I do this. I'm the only guy in the audience. I do this. Yeah, we start clapping. Yeah. Like, <laughs> oh, no way. You guys are the only ones yeah. clapping. Yeah. Yeah. Everyone yeah. turn around and look oh, at you. Bro, oh, I was so impressed Bro. by her. Yeah. And I'm, I'm literally, I, great. I'm feeling my blood pressure rise and my heart beating fast because yeah. I'm like, I want to get in. You want to get, you want to get in oh, on this yeah. bad. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get in bad, but I don't want to be rude. And I'm like, I need to like, like, ooh, fight. And you yeah. want to like jump in. Oh, so yeah. then, you know, so then she, he's, she's like, I, you know, you shouldn't focus. You like the majority of your nutrition should not be processed food. And, and then he goes, well, what's, what's the difference? And she's like, well, I, you should eat food. That's like not dead. Uh-huh. And he goes, well, what's dead food and what's a life? So he's trying to play semantics. She, unfortunately, she wasn't doing a good job saying her point because she could have totally clowned on him, but she was kept saying things that you could tell she was a little apologetic because she's on the yeah, panel. It was like face to face, you know, so she was trying to be a little soft in her delivery yeah, so, and like make it a little more anecdotal, but like she totally could have roasted him. Yeah. So then they're like, oh, you know, who, anybody have any questions? So I raise my hand yeah. and I stand up. And, uh, and I said, I don't remember exactly what I said, but I said something like, you know, real food is the food that we co-evolved with and we ate for thousands of years. Processed food is assuming that we 
fully understand human metabolism. And it's widely understood that the human metabolism, besides the brain, is the most complex Insanely thing. Insanely complex. In, yeah. in the universe. There's, there, that's the second most complex. Mammalian metabolism is the second most complex thing that we've observed in the universe. We don't fully understand how it works. And to assume that we can process something and invent something and call it perfect nutrition and this is all you can eat is uh, at best ignorant at worst it's uh, dangerous t- it's dangerous and what I, and the example that he gave that really fucking pissed me off is he goes this is before I said any of that he's like oh yeah he goes I went 30 days on just Soylent and the CEO went 30 days on just Soylent and he goes and uh, you know that's he goes that's proof in our concept and then that's when the first thing I said when I stood up is I said, well, I said, you could go 30 days on just eating peanut butter. Or no food. Or just eating hot yeah, dogs hot or dogs. eating no peanut food. Peanut butter or hot dogs. Yeah. That's what I said. Yeah. Or no food. And yeah. I said, so it doesn't prove anything at all. Yeah. Yeah. And then I, I, tra- I went over and asked Molly a question about food intolerances because I didn't want to just make a statement. Like, let me raise my hand and be an asshole. And sit down. <laughs> so I'm like, I got to ask a question. So anyways, uh, after I said that, you know, you could tell people were kind of looking at me. And then at the end of it- oh, You could see in the video, there's a dude that's back by, by, by you- and he's just like, who the hell is this guy? Uh, where did this come <laughs> yeah. from? After, yeah. <laughs> you yeah. see it on his face. It was totally out of left field. I loved it. It was like, uh, you know, you could feel the, the uncomfortableness. In did the Taylor air. catch the footage? I know Taylor yeah, was there. Yeah. He had it on his, uh, yeah, on the yeah, blog. He caught the whole thing. And uh, you could, you know, afterwards, two people came up to me and like thanked me for saying that or whatever. And I got in line because I wanted to talk to Molly because she's, uh, she is a doctor. Um, the, uh, I did some research on her. Taylor knows all about her. She's like a concierge practicing. Doctor. Yeah, so she's trying to create a new way that we treat people or whatever. And I don't know all the details about it. And hopefully she comes on the show. She mm-hmm. said she would and talks about it. But I, but she's abrasive, which I fucking love. Because then they brought up another guy um, yeah. who's like this expert on longevity. Aubrey, oh, right. uh, Aubrey Gray. DeGray. Aubrey DeGray. Aubrey DeGray. Is that Something his like name, that? Doug? Mm-hmm. Aubrey yeah. DeGray. They were talking about Aubrey de Grey, how he's this like super expert on longevity. Yeah. And then she piped up and she goes, I'm gonna be honest with you. She goes, I don't want to look like him. He looks like he's sick and old. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't he's look almost healthy. on the verge of death. And I'm yeah. like, oh shit, I love her. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like she'll just talk like shit. Like everybody that revered this guy, right? Yeah. She's just like, I don't she's wanna like, be like She's that like, guy. no, he yeah. looks terrible. That yeah. doesn't look healthy to me. So um I went up afterwards and I introduced myself and she's like, she knew all about us. She yeah. knew about Mind Pump. And she was like, she's like, she she's a fan. She's yeah. a fan. no way, really. Uh, yeah. She listens to us, and um, she, oh, you got to have her on the show. Then. I did. I gave yeah. her. My, she gave me her cell number, and I already sent the information over to uh, Katrina. Yeah, she'll be a fun to, guest. That's Aubrey de Grey. This is the guy they were. <laughs> are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, right. No way. This is like their their demigod guy. The, he's he's the longevity kind of, expert. Yeah, How old is he though? Is he like eighty something? No, no, he's really not eighty. No, it's like dude. fifty or no, something. No, hold on. No, he's not. Give me his age. You have to tell me that you put that picture up. Let me look yeah. him up. There's no way that guy's yeah, fucking. We have 50. to do some digging on this guy yeah, for see. sure. He looks eighty. Hold on, hold on. He yeah. was born in nineteen. He's fifty four, dude. Yeah, oh see, my! Are you kidding me? No, he's no. fifty four. Come on. I could find you. I could find you a handful of people that are more than a handful of people that are fifty something years old that have never even worked out and ate right and look better than that, dude. <laughs> dude, <laughs> wow. Yeah, yeah. You know, Doug is fifty years old and Doug looks as young as. Oh, we that, do. what a great! That's what we got to do. We're, we're got, okay, so if, oh my god. Yeah. He's fifty. Yeah. So he's. Oh, uh, he looks great. Yeah. He looks just what I want to look he looks like. Looks like ZZ saying. Top. Yeah. yeah. He's no, a, he, no. ZZ Top looks better. And yeah. ZZ, ZZ Top does. ZZ, ZZ, ZZ Top has got like twenty years on them, and he look, they look better, dude. <laughs> yeah, that's They're true. out still jamming, man. Come no, on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. a he's a really smart dude. He's got some interesting research, but yeah, she made a good point. So anyway, yeah, that was uh, funny. Anyway, dude, uh, it made me realize uh, that the information that people are sharing right now, the most people, is so. Well, we're it's, kind of in a bubble, and I think that we are, th- this dude. was an exercise, and I love that Taylor kind of set this up to, well, to make us realize that we're a little bit in a bubble, like our podcasting circle, like the information that we're constantly receiving or giving out, like, you know, it's still pretty much like a little micro environment. Like, it's, it's not as expansive as we thought. Like well, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw something out there that's totally like talking shit right now. Man, I'm going to do it without using names so I don't get us get us in too much trouble. What if I know who it is? Can I say their name? Well, I'll tell you no. <laughs> well, I'll tell you I'll tell you who it's about. Okay. It's about Dave Asprey. And there's a lot of people out there that like, you know, cuz this bulletproof is exploding everywhere, oh, yeah. Yeah, everywhere yeah, right? And juggernaut brand. Bi- biohacking and kudos to the brand and what they're doing and there is a lot of great stuff behind that. But I know somebody who does work on him and they they say that 
if this guy's living his brand like he talks, he's not as healthy and as in good a condition as he tries to claim. And in fact, he's pretty he's got a lot of work to do inside internally and stuff. So I know and that this is coming from the person who's doing the work on him. So mm-hmm. it's not somebody who's hearsay saying, oh, like I heard this or that. No, this yeah. is a person who's working on him, helping him out to work, work through a lot of the issues that he's got. So what's happened is brands like that have exploded and we've now got these little mini pods popping up all over the Silicon Valley where anybody that has a little bit of information and knowledge on the latest and greatest biohack can now throw these little seminars, attach a brand to it and sell to these little you know, engineers. Let me just say one thing. I feel this whole like biohacking thing like oh. came about because of uh, ego like because of like engineers scientists like people within like the silicon valley uh you know like ceo kind of realm they're like you know fitness whatever we can f- like hack our way through this like we don't have to do uh all these like uh rigorous activities and like you Bro, know really pay attention to i'll tell you so much if it was if we don't have to sleep you know all these hours we can hack our way through this it's it's it, this is what it is okay biohacking is a term invented by marketers to sell you more fucking shit. It's no different than build muscle, burn fat. You know, this. it's no different. It's just another category I'll tell that you, they've come up with to sell you shit. I'll tell you right now. Yeah. If uh, I remember this. I remember when the first time we were heading out to meet Ben Greenfield. And I remember it, I had already dug through all the stuff. We hadn't met in person yet. And I remember thinking, like, I'm going to fucking lay into this dude. But when we met him and I saw the way he left, lived his life, it's the only reason why I was like, okay, I can respect that. Like yeah. this, if there is a guy that has any business messing around with all this stuff, this dude, and I get it. Like I, he's experimenting. He's he, like the he, exception. He hundred percent lives his life by like you know he is dialed in yeah. more dialed than almost anybody I've ever met in my mm-hmm, life. Mm-hmm. So okay, if someone's gonna fuck around with their body and try and hack into little things to get a little bit of a competitive edge and then talk about it, like I can respect that. But ninety nine percent of the population has no business even even fucking around with well, shit he like has that. Because, the baseline already established. Well, that's what I mean. Right? Like, like yeah, if you're not. Really- like did if all you're the not, work. If you're not sleeping, you're not eating right, you're not doing all these other, your stress levels are all over the place, and then you're trying to biohack one thing, like yeah. give me this this drink that's going to help me do this, or give me these new glasses, or give me this tool that's going to help that. Like no, like there, if you took if you took care of the things that have been around forever that we've known help the human body out, if you take care of those big fucking rocks first, yeah. it's triple, ten times more important more to that. your overall health, strength, building muscle, burning fat, more productivity, all the things that the biohacking community pitches yeah. as like oh this is what you're doing it for like yeah okay if you take that you know this one thing that they're pitching and selling whether it be a supplement whether it be infrared whether it be sunglass fucking blue blockers whatever it is if you took somebody who's got everything perfect and then you add that one thing sure they might get a competitive well, edge the vibe that i was getting to was very reflective of the high performance sports realm because yes. because it's like it's no different in in their arena like all they care about is productivity, like you know your 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 output, like what what you're accomplishing, like business wise. So business to them is their ultimate peak pinnacle, like sport arena. And so now, how can we sort of uh, you know all this other stuff? How can we figure this out to to feed into you know this peak performance mentality? Now I will say this, uh, and this was very interesting because I'm seeing much more of this. There's this misconception. That and every generation does this. That the that the current younger generation is somehow you know fucking things up and whatever. Like millennials, they don't. here's what I'm learning about millennials. Millennials are very very interested. They're thirsty for knowledge and to, and to better themselves. There's all kinds of studies to show that right it's now. It's fucking like, awesome. Yeah. And they're yeah. also more entrepreneurial minded yeah. than many other generations. In fact, it's cool. It's become cool again to talk about being an entrepreneur mm-hmm. to when I go to these things, here's all these kids who are working for other companies. They're all employees or whatever. It's a biohacking thing and they're all relating it to entrepreneurship, entrepreneurship. I keep hearing that yeah. all the time, which is exciting for me. Yeah. It's just they're feeding it. You know, These people presenting this information, 
they're giving them a lot of shit information. Right. I mean, you're talking. Okay, I could just imagine this group, and I wasn't there, so I don't know. But you guys can tell me if I'm wrong. But you're looking at this huge group of all these engineers and people that are trying to biohack, and it's like, you know, it's crazy. If all of them started lifting weights three times a week, they would see a massive improvement in their overall performance, oh, yeah. life, everything. Right. Dude, you well, just just. I mean, iterating you- balance. I mean, that that's one of those things that we were talking about it, like how like this disassociation of like peak performance, you know, being outside of balance. No, your body performs its best when it's in balance, you know, and like it that is not a point that any of them are that's even right. reiterating. You, there are times when you can take your body out, out of balance to squeeze out yeah. more focal performance on a particular thing. Like if you're going to maximize your you know, your 50 yard dash, or you're going to maximize your bench press, or you're going to maximize your extreme performance when I'm cramming for this test, or I'm cramming this project, or I'm creating this business. You can definitely do that. Overall, however, that is a very short term uh, process for success. Long term, mm-hmm. it's terrible. It's a terrible way to succeed long term because at some point, things start to give and then you're fucked. You destroy yourself, you reduce performance, you reduce performance in all aspects, not just your your fitness or your mental capacity, but everything else. So Justin's absolutely correct. Balance, you will perform better all the time with that in mind. And understanding that means that when I do tip the scale out of balance. How do you navigate back to balance? That's right. Like, okay, like sometimes you do have a deadline. Like, oh shit, we got to cram guys. We got to work till 2 a.m. today. Okay, I know what I can do to squeeze that out. But now I got I understand that the rest of this, my body, my everything from my hormones to everything else are going to start to adapt towards that. I got to understand the side effects of that and how do I bring myself back into balance because what a lot of people get stuck <laughs> doing is they squeeze something out and they're like, "Cool, I'm going to do this all the time." Yeah. I'm going to do this all the time because I was able to squeeze out this extra performance. Right. No, you screw yourself up and you screw yourself royally. But I will say this, you know, uh, you can see you can see signs of low testosterone very, very strongly in this younger generation, especially in this generation. I'm sitting in this room and I'm seeing these dudes, and <laughs> yeah. and and I'm looking at them. And I'm th- thinking exactly what you what you said, Adam. I'm looking at them going, and some of them like, even who brought here up lifts weights. They even brought up testosterone. One of the guys who was talking talked about how you know he took a uh, he took a, a, me- a medicine a, a prescription because he was losing hair at a young age propecia yeah not yeah. realizing that it would and by the way he oh, his God. his misunderstanding of what it was doing to his body was all over the place yeah but he was talking about how it lowered testosterone actually it doesn't it just messes with dehydrotestosterone and anyway but he was talking about having low testosterone and I'm looking at him, and I'm looking at all these dudes in the room who are really listening, like, oh, yeah, how do I raise my t- testosterone? Right. And like I'm like, if, if you fuckers lifted weights, that's, that, would kill, that would do everything that you, that you want. Yeah. None of these supplements or biohacks are going to do that for you. Well, imagine, imagine what just lifting weights does, what it does as far as improving your sleep, what it does as far as improving your hormones, what it does as improving strength. Testo- I mean, there's so many benefits that all these, all these guys and girls that are probably listening to these biohackers – are going to benefit, and nobody talking about that. We're all talking about a soylent, or we're talking about a pill, or we're t- and I bet we're all avoiding that. Yeah, everything else but you know resistance training. Ah, uh, dude, it's ki- it's killer to see uh, where it's going. I didn't realize that you've got these pods like this. Hot. It makes total sense, though, right? Like you see how huge Bulletproof has gone, uh, how ma- massive of a brand it has gone in the short amount of time that we've been around, right? So, I mean, mm-hmm. you know, Bulletproof didn't exist what eight years ago or whatever. Mm-hmm. I don't remember when when Dave started or whatever, but I mean, when we were trainers, nobody was trying, nobody was biohacking anything. Like there was no, that that wasn't even a thing. That's another thing people don't understand. And it's not to say that we haven't involved in science and we're not learning more about the body. And, you know, and I, and I know I just threw a bunch of random stuff out there, like the, the infrared and the blue blockers. Listen, if you're sitting in front of a computer screen all day, I totally think that's not a bad strategy to have blue blocker glasses on. Like I think that's, but the, the main point is. We're now we're pushing into soylent. We're pushing into supplement supplementing things like for your hormones and for food that you're not getting because you're not eating properly. You're not exercising. It's like no, like listen, you, these are things that maybe if I have to be at the computer screen and it's eleven o'clock at night, like hey, maybe I throw on my blue bars. But I also should be training myself that that's not ideal. Yeah. That's not what I should be doing for my body all the time. It's, if it's, I want good rest, good sleep, I don't want it to affect my hormone levels. If I don't want that, you got to find better balance. It's a lot of the like same kind of feeling like you you had a long time ago of like what was trending at the time and like so because even when I took an Uber with Taylor later to to go to the meeting um you know some we were sharing a a ride with somebody else who was a CEO of this company that was like 
you know, I was doing some interesting stuff as far as like, you know, data and, and, and retrieving like your, your personal online profile of like all your information and all that stuff. But uh, anyway, he was talking our ear off. But I bet t- Taylor could have been one of these fucking kids if it wasn't for finding us, dude. 100%. I all mean, right. he was already part of another startup and like, you know, yeah. it, it's attractive. It's a lot of energy. Like, all like, I mean, I, I, I enjoy like being around the vibe, you know, of like the, all these kids that are like hungry to, mm-hmm. to work and do cool dude. shit and like change the world that's the cool part and i'll tell you something that i realized seeing this like purpose I, I, yeah. I, what i'm what i'm sitting there thinking is we need to do more of that yeah. i'm looking at this group of people that all they did was get this newsletter and they're like hey we're gonna and it was it was uh you know it, it wasn't that organized we should the throw we should wasn't throw that great we should throw a biohacking conference that doesn't talk anything about all that shit yeah yeah it's just like talks about exercise <laughs> eating natural foods just flip <laughs> it's it on all its, like just yeah. the staple Fli- yeah That's flip it. it on its head <laughs> i would <laughs> love that yeah, I, I would but, right? it, but you'll it, be hella mad yeah. but i mean <laughs> you, you, wait a minute yeah you guys did really cover you know <laughs> like butter and coffee yeah, <laughs> yeah. why is this an I apple get it what kind of apple is this yeah this is a normal apple yeah did you biohack it? No, it's just a regular apple. I, I, it just makes me realize that we should do more of that kind of stuff no. because there's a lot of people hungry for this kind of information, especially in that age group. And I think we can make a huge impact just by like, because I mean, here's the thing. They're smart kids. They're yeah, really, really smart kids. For sure. When I made my comment, you could see people's faces light up and go, that makes sense. Oh, you know what I mean? Because I was logical and I explained it the way I explained it. I was going to ask you: Did anybody come up to you? I know you went over and talked to Molly. Did anybody else? Come yeah, up? I had several people come up to me and be like, "Dude, that was a really good point you made, and that's a great question. I'm glad you said that." And so, I mean, and like I said, they're smart kids. Like, if you present it in a way that's logical and objective, uh, I think they'll listen. Mm-hmm. I, I really do. I think you'll win, uh, which is which is. Very enlightening. Do you know it's awesome. Do you know what's funny? The the biohacking community is not much different than the you know muscle building and fat oh. loss community that we talked about and what we've been a part Dude, of. Dude, Soylent was years. the bro science of the biohacking. Community. Right. No, one hundred percent. No, it is. Yes. When you think we think about like, oh my god, think about how and because there is science to support it. Right. I mean, you can take somebody. And you could take them, and you, and then if they're on a crappy diet, and you, well, and you can, put them on Soylent for thirty days, you can show markers of improvement, sure, sure. right? So you can t- you can build science around all these products to support how it's no. Di- it reminds me of the fat loss and muscle building community that we've been a part of for twenty years. It's not much different, bro. It's just it's actually just poking at different people. You want to know instead what's of funny? going after the going after the guys that want to be buff and yeah. have those insecurities, it's tapping into the people that are plugged into yes, the computer all day, feeding into the dysfunction. It's, 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 like, Here, it's, you can it's do the this fat way. loss muscle building community of the of the internet geek world. It is, yeah. but you know you know what's really funny. So Soylent is a meal replacement powder. That's what it is, right? But they're but what they did is they advertised and marketed to a group of people that are not interested in, in building in, muscle or burning in, fat. They're only interested in improving their work performance, performance at work yeah. or their creativity. Because of that, and because that's such a new market, they dominated that market with a shitty product. And what I mean by that is there's other meal replacements out there that aim towards marketing towards muscle builders and fat burn uh, people who want to lose fat. Because that market has been around longer and it's more saturated and there's more competition, the meal replacement powders in that area <laughs> are, better. are way better. As a meal replacement, soylent is shit. The main ingredient is fucking GMO soy and corn. Yeah. Those are the main ingredients. Yeah. It's fucking garbage. <laughs> it's fucking from, for, for just for a meal replacement, it's shit. Forget about the fact that it's that the way they're marketing it is fucking dangerous and horrible. Yeah. If you compare it as a meal replacement, metrics from the '90s kicks its ass. That's funny. It's but, all macro based. It's like it has no quality control. You know what it is? Yeah. It's it's proteins, fats, carbs, and uh, and then they throw in vitamins. It's all about margins for them. Yeah, yeah, it's all about margins. They could yeah. probably make that cheaper than almost anything else of course and that's yeah. what it, and just and push it out the fun, the irony of it all the irony is that these kids who they're marketing to do not know where the name soylent comes from they don't know what that's a throwback to which is hilarious to me. <laughs> I know. it's I mean, almost like they played a joke they, on everybody yeah it's like they're punking <laughs> it's they're punking them yeah it's like hey we, i bet we can name hey, it this over here you remember no. charlton heston the, yeah. soylent no soylent green if you're listening right now and you probably haven't seen that movie unless you're older Soylent was a, it was a movie about this like dystopian future where when you got old, they took you to these like uh, to this paradise. So when you got old, you <laughs> grinded got to, up old people. But <laughs> the reality is, they took the old people and they killed them and turned them into something yeah. called Soylent Green, which was feeding 
the rest of the population. The rest of the population, they're eating old people. Yeah, Soylent Green. Soylent. That's yeah. where the name yeah. Soylent <laughs> comes from. Yeah. And it's they a, fucking, it's like a joke. It's, it's great. Yeah, it's so ironic. It's a joke. I oh. hope somebody tags the CEO oh, of Soylent. Bring it, dude. Hey, yeah. hey bring CEO, uh, if you got balls, come on Mind Pump and debate me. Oh, my God. You big pussy. Bring on the bird, Doug. <laughs> being brought to you by Chimera Coffee. It's the only coffee that is infused with all natural nootropics for a cleaner, calmer, and more focused buzz without the crash. Click the Chimera link at mindpumpmedia.com and input the discount code MINDPUMP at checkout for 10% off. It's the motherfucking quad. The eagle has landed. Quee-qua. First up is Fower Fit. Should you be giving nutritional advice or prepping people for competitions if you are not a registered dietitian? <laughs> this, is great. this is like a. Oh my god! This is like a yes and no. Right? Totally. Yeah, it's yeah. like totally. A, it's like I don't. I mean, I'm not a registered dietitian, yeah. and I've I've given plenty of people uh, information about doing that. Now, I there I also uh, preface it with that also that listen, I'm I'm not a nutritionist, I'm not a doctor. Right. Uh, you know, here's some parameters, and I, I teach that way. Um, but I definitely think that there is a ton of people. Uh, in fact, I think there's a majority of the people giving out nutrition advice uh, have no business. Now, I also want to say that I've actually trained and had a lot of registered dietitians that aren't as savvy um, as people think they are. I haven't met one yet that impressed me. That's- yeah, it's it's not like it's it's. And, and I, of course, I'm. Oh, this is an overgeneralization, so I know there's probably a registered uh, an RD that's listening to this right now that I'm totally offending, and it's not well, everybody. There's, I'm sure the ones that listen to our show are awesome. Right, right, yeah. exactly. So yeah, if you're, you're if awesome. they're forward thinking. The, yeah. the, the the registered. So just being a registered dietitian doesn't make you any more qualified to give nutritional advice to a competitor because let's be let's be honest, competing is not a healthy sport. We all we've talked about this on the show. So no registered dietitian is actually going to put a diet together. For a competitor, because you are you're flirting with the boundaries. It's like there's they're they're taught for they're they're yeah. taught to try and feed the body health, which some of them don't even do a great job doing that. So they're not going to go. A registered dietitian is not going to say, "Okay, Adam, you're getting ready for your pro show, and we are going to cut carbohydrates and we're going to manipulate sodium." And like, no, they're not going to do any of that stuff. And no. this type of stuff for stage presence to make the body look a certain way is necessary. So, so my aunt. Uh, is a registered dietitian, and she's been one for a long time. And we used to get into debates at family functions. Oh wow! Mm-hmm, over nutrition, over what's healthy, what's not healthy. My uncle is a Chinese herbalist, uh, or he's he's uh, certified in Chinese medicine. So we used to three of us would sit there, and we would what a what a great dynamic. Thanksgiving panel. How, how long ago was this happening? Like 15 uh, well, years ago still, even when you were more broed out and we stuff? We still have great discussions and debates on nutrition and stuff and it's great because everybody has a different perspective. Right? Totally. Those are like three total different right. perspectives. But me, so I was definitely wrong early on because I would say things like you need to eat tons of protein, small meals, all stuff and both of them were like saying no. And But as I progressed and I learned more my message started resonating more or like connecting uncle. more with my uncle. I bet. And my aunt was still arguing. She's like, no, you know, a diet needs to be low in saturated fat. A diet, ne- a diet needs to be higher in grains and whole wheat and all these other things that dietitians believe because that's what they're taught. Yep. Until her son was uh, stricken with Crohn's disease. Whoa. Very, Whoa. very bad. What a, what a fucking flip that all on very, its Very, very, very bad. Not only that, but her other daughter's got severe food allergies and her husband has, you know, uh, has gone through, you know, uh, bouts of uh, really bad gout and other stuff like that. So her son got Crohn's really bad. Uh, and it's terrible for anybody who suffers from Crohn's. I have, like I said, this is somebody very close to me. I've seen what it does, how difficult it could be. And my aunt is extremely intelligent, very, very intelligent, uh, like go, like figure things out yourself kind of person. Like she's very tough lady. Like if she's given a challenge, she'll step up to the plate and fucking do it. And that's what I love about her the most. And so she did that because the treatments for Crohn's are terrible. You go to the, you go to the doctor. Just give you some supplements, some pills and shit. uh, Well, it's steroids, but if it's really bad, they'll give you a form of chemotherapy to really hammer your immune system. Damn it, really? Yeah. Or... They'll cut out, you know, parts of your, I your know, digestive system. I didn't know they use chemo for it's that. A, it's a type of chemotherapy. It's got, it increases your risk of other cancers later on and all this other stuff because 
what Western medicine is trying to do is to hammer the symptom, which is this rampant inflammation that's mm. going on in your body, which in extreme cases is needed sometimes because if you don't do that, then the kid or person will die anyway, right? So she's like, hell no. I don't want to do that kind of stuff. Let me do my research because all the stuff that she understood as a registered dietitian, she was doing and he had this terrible reaction. Nothing was helping. So she, nothing she knew uh, based on her education as a dietitian was helping her. So she went online and went on these forums and started reading anecdotes from people with Crohn's. And she started reading books on ketogenic dieting, on uh, the, on gluten, on GMOs, on and she started reading all these obscure studies on animals, all these other things that registered dietitians are not taught. <clears throat> she finally decided, uh, I'm going to put my son on what's called the carbohydrate-specific diet. That had to have been such a crazy situation for her, especially now that you tell the story, because I didn't know this is how this went down, because yep. you've told parts of all this stuff before on the show, but I didn't realize that all three of you were coming from different perspectives like that, probably battling out over dinners and talking about stuff. Bro. Yeah. Then that her son gets stricken with Crohn's, and now now you're for and you're trying, you're still trying what you've been taught. It's not working. You're forced to dig deeper and think, try things that she, you probably don't believe in. She rejected Wow. She rejected everything that she believed in before. She now she's like, me and her are on the same exact page. Now, granted, I've also evolved since then. I've learned things as well. But both of us are, we sit down, we talk about these things. And it's, well, I bet, it's she, awesome. I bet she was part of your evolution, right? In um, a sense, because I'm sure you're battling her kind of from the bro side and you're watching, or was that later? No. So at the when he was going through his stuff, uh, I, you know, uh, right around that time or maybe a little before it, I had my own gut issues happen. And then I had a close family member with cancer. So I was doing other research on my own, but it all pointed to the same stuff. So she puts her son on a carbohydrate specific diet, which is basically grain free. Eliminate all grains, no, especially no gluten. All GMOs are gone. All this other stuff. And by the way, now it's starting to get more credence in the in, in Western medicine. But at the time, she was laughed at by her by her colleagues. She was laughed at by the doctors that she would bring this to. She would show this to the doctors, and the doctors would say to her, "It's not going to do anything, but you can try it if you want. It doesn't look like it'll hurt, but it's not going to do anything." Like they laughed at her. Well. He went into complete remission, complete remission. Wow! From doing, from following Boom. this, and it's very, very different. So my point with the story is, uh, there's definitely people who are not registered dietitians who give advice that should not be giving any fucking advice. <laughs> You're right. Yeah. Registered dietitians know a lot more than the average person, but that doesn't mean that they're going to give you great advice. No. Now, when it comes to prepping for a competition, the, a, a dietitian's got is, no clue. They're not going to help you at all. No clue. No. When it comes to nutritional advice for the average person or whatever, the registered dietitians are going to follow the standard American advice of uh, the pyramid. What's in the, yeah. the worst institution? The worst yeah. fucking pyramid ever. Yes, yeah. eat well, lots it's of been bought by eat yeah. lots of whole grains. Uh, reduce your intake of you know saturated fats. Increase Processed your intake foods are fine. of of uh, monosaturated, polyunsaturated fats like corn oil or soybean oil or these highly processed, you know, damaging fats. Um, they're going to say, you know, you, you know, eat a little bit of protein, eat a little bit of fat, eat a lot of carbohydrates. Um, they're, they're, you know, processed foods are absolutely fine. Candy um, sparingly. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's, yeah. it's, uh, their advice isn't excellent either. It's based on all that kind of shit. Now, where dietitians do very well is when they're dealing with people who have kidney disease or, you know, you know, some of these other disorders where you have to be very careful with how you, you know, manipulate their diet because organs aren't working properly. But otherwise, I've had registered dietitians as clients who yeah, so have I. I have complete, I've changed their their right. understanding of positions on nutrition and stuff. So that's why I say that because I, I mean I, I'm probably I've probably had ten I think in my career my whole career I've probably trained a total of ten of them mm. and most of them hired me to help them out. So and they had a, a very good understanding of nutrition, so it was very easy to talk to them. Oh, I want you to do this for these reasons. Yeah, dude. Yeah, she, yeah. So we have these great conversations because she'll tell me that <clears throat> she'll get these clients that are super obese. And her standard of care with the people like that is to put them on these uh, uh, these the liquid, drink. Yeah, yeah, the drink. Oh, yeah. That's oh, what they're yeah. taught. They're taught that. They're taught and, it with, if bars, you, yeah. when you get to a point. Like, so, again, another great point right there is, and that was actually, so funny you bring that up, the first uh, RD that I did take uh, take on worked at Kaiser because remember at Santa Teresa and mm -hmm. Cottle we were right really across close. the street. So mm -hmm. I had a lot. That's when I got a that's lot. Of, I got all my A lot too, of nurses, yeah. a lot of doctors, a lot of RDs. And uh, I, I actually trained the head girl for 
uh, all, the whole nutrition plans for these obese people. Yeah. And I remember her like asking me like, you know, she wanted to lose like 20 pounds or something like that herself. And she was like, wanted me to like put her on. She wanted to take all the drinks and the bars. And I'm like, no, like, no, we're not doing that. (laughs) I'm not going to have you do that. Like, that's crazy. Yeah. So she, she tells me like, we'll have these great conversations. Well, she'll say, you know, she's like, Sal, I get these super obese people. And what I'm supposed to do is tell them to just go on this liquid diet. That's like 1200 calories. And she's like, and I sit there and I try to talk to them about why that's a bad idea, about how they should change the nutrition, whatever. She's like, but you know what sucks? She's like, many times we have to put them on the liquid diet because nobody wants to, they don't want to listen. Yeah. And she gets very frustrated. Yeah. She gets people who come in who will need uh, dialysis because she works a lot with, uh, with, with uh, that particular part of the population. And these people will do things that are explicitly horrible for them. And they'll come in and they'll need to get all this work done. And she's like, I, she's like, I don't know. She has even considered getting out of the medical side of the field because she's like, you know, Sal, she goes, when you're a personal trainer and insurance companies don't cover personal training, people come to you because they want to do what you're telling them. She's like, I'm getting a lot of people that- Oh, wow. They're there don't want, at a necessity. At a necessity. They don't even want to listen to what I right. have to do. Because they're, they're not paying anything no, out of it. It's just like- She's yeah. like, it's hard enough just to get them to take their pills. Like, just to, here, take this pill that you have to take because wow. your kidney function is so bad. Have I ever shared on the show that uh, one of the things that ha- used to happen to me a lot too that I would blow my mind because I was across the street from that clinic that actually used to help all the- you know, obese people put them on the shakes and everything like that. And I trained the, the head girl. I would get people come over to me. And it's funny because she, I know she used to talk about, she would, they wanted me to come over and do talks and things like that. And that time in my career, I had a lot of other stuff going on, so I couldn't do this. But, uh, you know, I ended up helping uh, the RD and she got in great shape and she would tell everybody like, go see Adam, go see Adam. So I'd get all these referrals coming over. And I would actually get one out of every five or so would be somebody come in and they're probably... 40, 50 pounds overweight, and they'd, they would hire me to help them get fatter so they could then either, one, get the surgery oh, or right. qualify for the program. So in yeah. order for you to get qualified for the insurance program, you have to be X amount of pounds overweight. You have mm-hmm. to be met, considered medically obese, and I, I would get people that were right on the borderline of medically obese. They would come to me. They'd want to hire me to get them fatter so they could do either the surgery or go through the fucking program so their insurance would cover it. I was just, I was blown away. Like, yeah. that's a real thing. People are out hiring trainers to get I know, fatter. I, know. <laughs> I thought, this is fucking crazy. I know. It. Yeah. Yeah. I actually had a client who was so obese that they had to lose a little bit of weight before the doctors would operate on them. Mm-hmm. So this guy comes in, this was years ago, loses 30 pounds by following my advice and stuff like that. And he's like, all right, thanks. I'm going to go get the surgery. I'm like, dude, you're doing good. Like, what if we just keep yeah. doing this? Yeah, peace out. What if we just keep doing this? No, 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 I'm going to go get my surgery. Crazy. I know. Crazy. Yeah. Next question from Scotland360. What are your favorite muscle building meals that you have as staples? And when you're wanting to pack on mass, what are your go-to meals? You know what's funny? And this is going to sound like a, a shameless Organifi plug right here. And and I know that the, the green juice, I'm not building a ton of muscle. But I will say, and and I'm and you don't have to necessarily take the green juice. So this is half a shameless plug for organic. Well, this is your favorite. The question is yours. So. Yeah, and and it's so funny because you wouldn't think that uh, a green juice would have anything really to do with that. But I actually can feel my body just like operating better when I'm either one getting my four to six servings of greens every single day, and if I'm not getting the four to six, I'm making sure I'm taking the uh, green juice at least once or twice a day based off that. So my goal always is to get it naturally, 100%. But and I'll be the first to admit that that doesn't happen. And in the past, I would just be like, oh, no big deal. I'll try and make it up later in the week and try and get more. But I could never catch up. I would never be able to get four to six in every single day consistently seven days a week. And since I've introduced that into my routine, it's unbelievable how how strong I feel how much energy, my, my, my energy levels feel consistent. And then that, that to me affects my training. If I'm, if I feel good, I have good sustained energy throughout the day. I'm sleeping better. I feel better when I wake up. I feel more balanced. My stomach feels good. I have fucking awesome workouts. And it's funny because they don't connect something like that to anything to do with muscle building. Like no one markets it that way. But for me personally, 
I, I'm getting more from that than I did from creatine in the past. I'm getting more uh, more from that than I did from other, like, you know, your your testosterone booster bullshit that I took as a kid. Like, all these things that I took to try and build muscle, I feel way better. Yeah, all the I, nutrients are there now. Right. Like, my body feels more balanced. Mm-hmm. Because my body feels more balanced, I feel like I can perform better, which in turn helps in that way, which is crazy. And really, it's more of a testament. It's less of a testament to, you know, Organifi's green juice, even though I love it. It's more a testament of balancing your diet out is so much more important than any fucking muscle building meal or yeah. supplement you could possibly it's funny yeah, there's no formula it's not like you get this like one dish that's like okay this is the one that is my muscle right. building dish right because if, if the rest of the day is all out of balance and yeah. fucked up yeah. then I, you're it's not funny too because rotation of foods all nobody thinks of vegetables as, as muscle building right that's why right. i wanted yeah. to point like, it what out do you, what do you do when you want to build mass well yeah. the first thing i do is <laughs> i make sure i eat more vegetables just like, whey protein the shit out of there's it there's barely any macros in vegetables what are you talking about yeah. but do you guys have like like meals that you that you tend to go to when you're like okay I want to bump my calories I want to increase my strength mm-hmm. and these meals tend to because here's the, so for me I do have meals that I'll tend to gravitate towards and it's mainly because if I push calories hard with the wrong foods mm. I may start to gain strength but then I'll be unbalanced like Adam's saying because I'll have more inflammation or something right. or, or yeah. something like that and then I can't I can't eat any more and get the benefits from it. Now I'm just feeling like shit and I end up gaining body fat and I don't build muscle. So there are meals that I will eat if I want to uh, bump my calories that tend to feel good at the same time. I have I have one. That totally yeah. When I was competing, it was staple. <clears throat> I every morning had steak, eggs, spinach, and a small bowl of fruit. That's how I started every morning. And that's a for, decent amount of calories. It, oh, it's a big, I mean, it was a big piece of steak. It was probably a thousand calorie meal that I would have in the morning time. And you'd feel good. And I, and I normally lift around noon. So by the time that like had fully digested, it hit my system, I had incredible workouts. And it, and it was the staple, and I, and I still go back to that. I'm just, you know, right now, like building muscle and getting on stage is not my number one priority. So it's not like this huge, and that's a it's like a twenty five dollar fucking breakfast because I go out and eat it. You know, so, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. you know what I'm saying? I did. I eat it every single day for a very long time while I was competing. So. Well, that's a good point because I too um, don't tend to eat breakfast very often, and so just if I'm in more of an anabolic phase and I'm really focusing on muscle building, like that's. I will now start eating breakfast and I'll do that a little more routinely. And so I kind of undulate that uh, based off of my goals and kind of it's an easy way for me to, to sort of stick with a, a calorie uh, amount where, I, where I'm just slowly increasing that and like uh, adding in uh, more quality food like that. Uh, but then also like adding stuff like yams and like different types of carbohydrates that I'll mm. tend to increase the carbohydrate amount as well. Yeah, for me, it's uh, so one of my f- staple meals that just digests well for me and I, could, I definitely can gain muscle off, off of it and I feel good is white rice and uh, either ground beef or ground lamb. And I'll, I'll get the ground beef or the ground lamb. I'll cook it, season it, whatever. And I'll take the little bit of the grease that comes off of it and I'll pour that in the rice with the meat, break up the meat in there, mix it all up, and it's like this big... Dude, that was like a staple meal yeah. for me for such a long... And the only <laughs> difference I had to that was I, I normally used uh, the ground turkey, the fattier ground turkey, and I would chopped up onions. Yeah. And I would use, deli- I would, I would use the taco seasoning sauce on yep. it, and that was like... This, it's delicious, uh, yeah. it's it's easy to digest, and I, I when I eat it, I can eat a lot of it and feel okay, and then there's my extra calories to build. The other one that I'll do is buckwheat. Buckwheat is probably, let's see, buckwheat and I'd say either sweet potatoes or yams are easily, for me, the most easy digestive, uh, digestible uh, carbohydrate that I can pa- really pack on. I can, if I overeat other types of carbohydrates, they start to bother me. I can eat a big ass bowl of, so I go to Whole Foods and they have this organic buckwheat, buckwheat cereal. So you just, you cook it in water like you would cream of wheat or whatever. Hmm. And it's like, it's all, it's so easy to digest. I can eat like 80 grams of carbohydrates or hundred grams of carbohydrates in one so sitting. It's like a consistency, like a porridge or like an oatmeal kind of. It's almost like grits. It, it, okay. It's like grits, uh, which grits is another one that I can eat a lot of, but I, I try to stay away from too much corn because it's never organic. But I'll go with the buckwheat. I'll eat a big bowl of that in the morning with some other protein or whatever. And I don't feel like oh, and, you know, bloated or whatever. It's you know, really- you know what I notice mm-hmm. is if I and it's funny because we're talking about building mass. So when you think about building mass, most people are thinking like caloric surplus, surplus, surplus. And right. to, to Justin's note about undulating, man, I always feel amazing. So let's say, <clears throat> let's say I'm on my training routine, and today is 
Wednesday, and today I I'm not lifting. So today I'm going to be like in a super, I'm going to put myself in a major deficit or maybe even fast, even though I'm trying to build mass because I'm off. I'm not lifting today. I don't need everything to get after my lift. And then to, the next day, the refueling before I go lift mm-hmm. that if I do a really good like salt, a supercharger. Oh yeah. And like it's, I can feel it. I can feel my body like sucking up all the nutrients. Mm-hmm. From I literally can. And I can also tell when I'm like, because I in the past, I used to do the bulk like everybody else did where you bulked for three months or whatever like that. You feel sluggish and oversaturated. You feel bogged down. Yeah, like eating a, a certain meal doesn't ever affect me differently because I'm always, your gas tank is all the way filled up all the time. That th- that meal just overspills, if anything. It's not really. So I just read a study that shows that when uh, they took a bunch of men and then they had them go on a bulk and within, I believe within two days, if I'm not mistaken, within two days, they had dramatic uh, decreases in insulin sensitivity. Oh, I bet. Two days. I bet. So two days of going into like excess calories and just a lot of food, mm-hmm. their insulin sensitivity already plummeted, which means you're not going to really utilize that food the way you should. And you could be causing problems, which is why now if I'm bulking, I do what like Adam's talking about, where I do these mini bulks where I, I'll have three days of a surplus and I'll have a day of a deficit. And overall, it's a surplus, but I make sure to have those deficit days or a fast. And it's just way more effective. Yeah, because my body's more sensitive. I to can it. feel it. Yeah, I yeah. literally can feel the difference coming off a of fast and then refueling, and my body. And and ideally, I want that like steak and egg and spin. I, I want a meal like that. And for people denying that this makes a difference, because I know there's people who are going to be like, oh, insulin sensitivity, whatever. You're, you're, you know, it doesn't make a big difference. It fucking does. This is why bodybuilders who take anabolic steroids will inject themselves with IGF, insulin yeah. when they eat a lot of carbohydrates because they've they've got this huge insulin load now they're going to get all these all this glycogen amino acids into their muscle cells and they get, they build a lot of mass from it that is a great point because that speaks to like what I would see all the time because that was very very popular in with within my peers and stuff while competing was, Which I don't recommend. By the was way. was taking insulin was was taking insulin, and that's why they take it for that exact reason. And it's like, man, you could get some of those same effects if you would just throw a fast in every once in a while or a deficit. But most my competitors, you're either on the bulk or you're on the cut. There's none of this like in between. It's either aggressively bulking mm-hmm. for three months, yeah. living in a crazy surplus, living in the extreme, yeah, putting on weight almost every day. You know what I'm saying? Because you're eating, eating, it's eating. A, it's a hack. And I've been there. Yeah. I've been there before, so I totally understand that thought process and what you're trying to do and like struggling to put weight on, but it doesn't, it doesn't work that way. And if you actually allowed yourself to have a, a day in a deficit and then went back to pushing, you'll feel it. You and would you'll it, know it's a hack. You're you're increasing insulin sensitivity. You're increasing your body's sensitivity to protein. Cause there's evidence to show that all this protein all the time, your body becomes less efficient at using it. Um, so it, it, it makes sense on many, many different levels. And again, for competitors, you guys know exactly what that's like. The, the, one of the most anabolic feelings you could ever have in your entire life, even if you compare it to anabolic steroids, is the post-show oh, muscles oh. that you gain. It's And that was really what finally put it together for me. When I realized, so mind you, okay, think about a guy like me who's competing, I'm bulking, I'm dieting and for these shows. I'm on a consistent amount of steroids. I'm, I'm taking the same dosage uh, the whole time, right? So there's no fluctuation there. The only thing I'm manipulating is nutrition and cardio and weights and things like that. And nothing made my body feel more anabolic than the day after a show when I refed my body and I trained. It was the best workout I would have all year long. Mm-hmm. And it was it was actually what made me really get excited and really enjoy competing and doing that was that feeling because I had never felt that before. I'd taken anabolics before. I took anabolics for all the way from when I was 20-something years old. So I know what that feels like. No, And anybody that has knows like, oh, man, when you take that, you can feel it. But the feeling of the food trumped that. Oh, it blew my mind. Oh, it's painful pumps. It bl- it blew my yeah. mind. It blew my mind. What a difference that was. And that, what it was is, you know, leading up to a show, you're in a, a huge deficit for quite some time, and your body's ultra sensitive to food to the point where I remember in peak week and before that, like I and I've told you guys this before. I could feel my body. I could t- I could take in thirty grams of something, and I could just feel it go through my body. Could feel it go into my muscles. Could feel the energy all of a sudden mm-hmm. go up because I was so ultra sensitive because I was so dialed in. So it, getting it, undertaking from that, 
you know, it changed the way I bulked and cut it forever because mm-hmm. I understood like, whoa, like that's crazy. Like now I'll never do a bulk where I live in this surplus for a long period of time. It just doesn't make sense. Mm. Next question is from Hope Granger. What was the point that you realized you stopped lifting to impress women and were lifting to impress men? <laughs> you know what's you know what's great about this? This is hey, a look what I'm doing. This girl. is a, it's funny, but it's actually a great, great it's question. It's a very good yeah. question. For, yeah. First off, personally, for me personally, I never lifted weights to impress women. No. I could I had no problem you and me both. talking to girls. It wasn't an issue. In fact, it was years later that I realized that being, you know, building muscle from my weights was getting me attention. I remember being a, mm. I was either a sophomore or a junior in high school. It was hot outside. We had gone in, you know, came off of break. I went inside. I was in class. I took off my shirt and I had a, a wife beater on underneath. And this girl comes up to me and she's like, oh my God, look at your muscles. And then another girl came and they were like touching my arms. And I remember being like, oh, what? This is weird. I had no intentions of trying to impress girls with my muscles. It was all about impressing men. And it wasn't from because I wanted to date guys or anything like that. It was because I felt insecure. I felt insecure. I wanted to be stronger, more muscular. I wanted, you know, to, to have that status. And I felt uh, inadequate because I was a skinny kid. And, And the other reason why this is a great question is, most people, men and women, do what we do. We we think we're doing it for the opposite sex, and we are to an extent, but a large extent, possibly a larger extent, is for the same sex. And this has to do with women too. Yeah, women criticize women criticize each other way more harshly than a men men ever criticize women. Mm. That's true. You ever see women how they criticize or they each other's clothes? Admire other, or other women, you right? Know, like crazy, and they're like, "I want that what she has." Yeah, you know? and yeah. so a lot of people do this for the same sex, and it's not a you know, it's, it has nothing to do with sexual feelings. It's just you want to be regarded uh, in a particular way by your what you would consider your peers, which happens to be you know, if you're a man, other men, and if you're a woman, other women. Yeah, it was funny. I remember distinctively when I was just working out, my entire focus was to get to the next group. We had different groups of of weight classes of strength. So like uh, when I was playing uh, football, we had, you know, one class that, uh, you know, it was it was guys that were like, you know, 160, 165. And then you had like your 185s and you can get the 200s and like, you know, over 200s kind of group. And, you know, I kind of started out in sort of the um, uh, the cornerbacks, you know, those kind of like, you know, that weight class. I was, I was more skinny. And just over time, I, I would graduate into the next group, to the next group. I actually, by my junior, end of my junior year into my senior year, I was working out with all like the strongest linemen and like all these huge, <laughs> you know, and that was like what I wanted to accomplish. Like it was visibly something that I wanted to get into that group because I saw what they were putting up numbers wise. And and then as a result, I'm playing basketball and I'm, I have my shirt off. And then like, yeah, same thing. Or, or like uh, some some cheerleader girls like came over and were like, hey, yeah, what have you been doing? <laughs> and they started like petting my abs and my arms. I'm like, this is weird. Uh, but yeah. awesome. At the but same I was day. like, yeah, I was but, like, but oh, awesome. I'll encourage it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this isn't horrible. So I, I, uh, I have a little bit different experience. I, I went back and forth. Like, so 100% I'm on the same page with the boys that when I when I first started lifting it was definitely an insecurity amongst my peers my other other boys right because I was skinny I I was no they were I was made fun of for how skinny I was so definitely uh motivated by the insecurities of being the same size or bigger than my my buddies and and like you guys I remember uh starting to put size but at that time as a kid what's going through my head isn't that so if I'm being completely honest, I'm not thinking like, oh, I want to, I need to be bigger because my buddies are bigger, or I, you know, they're making fun of me. That's why I would do it. That's what subconsciously drove me. Mm. But I thought like I'm going to do it because the, the girls are going to want me more when I do it. So I was doing it with the intent, thinking that I was doing it for the girls. When I when I realized that as I continued to get bigger and more muscle and more muscle, I wasn't getting any more real attention from what I was when I didn't really lift. So I always dated, I always had girlfriends and I never had a, just like Sal was saying, I never had a problem getting a girl and it didn't really change much. I will say though, uh, getting, getting, taking myself to a whole nother level of fitness where, you know, then this is getting closer to my like late twenties 
where I had, you know, I, as a kid, remember, I graduated high school at 163 pounds. So I'm six foot two and a half or whatever I was because I still grew after high school. Uh, and 100, I'm a rail. And it took me all the way into my mid 20s just to get like 180 pounds, 190 pounds. Then I'm too, now I'm, I walk around at 230. So now when I got in the 200s, I was shredded. The attention from the women that I got then was different than I'd ever experienced in my whole like young childhood. So then there became this part uh, of me that did enjoy that piece of it. Although as a guy, you always are comparing your, you find yourself comparing yourself to other men. Mm -hmm. I don't like look at myself in the mirror and go, man, I hope the girls think I look good today. You know, it's like, yeah. it's you're lifting and you can't help but look around in the gym and look at other dudes. I, to this day, it's still a habit inside me when I go lift. I always Compared. know, I will always know, I don't know, I don't see any of the hot chicks. Katrina always, she always thinks, is fascinated by this because she'll ask me, which is, this is what, this, this conversation has happened many times <laughs> with us. Did you see that one girl? She kept walking by you, this and that. She was doing deadlifts in front of you. I'm like, no, I didn't see her. But I did see the big dude, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. I did see the big, which is yeah. funny, right? Isn't yeah. that funny that that's how how we we have seriously programmed ourselves oh, totally. that and and now I, for me it's uh, I I admire or respect it if I see another man that is uh, has taken his physique to that level. Uh, it's not an insecurity thing of me of like wanting to look that way because I've taken my physique to a, a, a very extreme level. So I don't go like, oh man, I want to look at like that because most of the time I have or been better. It's more like, oh, dude, I know that guy works hard. Like I know he's put a lot of work in to be that way. So there's like this admirable respect for it. So yeah, I definitely think that we were dr we were driven originally from that. I've felt it from the women. It feels good. I've I've shared on this podcast before. Uh, the feeling of being completely shredded. In I'll, I'll tell you what, if you're a guy and you're listening, uh, will being fit attract more women? Yeah, but it's not going to come anywhere close. I mean, we're we always talk about big rocks. Right. Like it ain't going to come anywhere close to becoming to learning how to be charming and charismatic. Oh, like, and, and I have, I exactly, oh, yeah. I have so many examples <laughs> of uh, experiences where I would go hang out with a buddy of mine who was shredded and handsome, who had terrible yeah. terrible, terrible game, game. Yeah. and would get no attention and then i've got buddies who are they're leeches man they're, they're, my game i have buddies who are outright unattractive not fit and would we, we'd go in a room and it was like within five minutes these dudes were like hugh hefner mm. and i've seen that so many times it made well, me realize I, like it yeah, doesn't it's, like as you, you definitely want to be healthy you don't want to be super unhealthy looking but if you're kind of healthy if you look normal but you've got you know how to communicate and you've got charisma. That's it right there. Hundred percent. This is why too, though. I think that you know. I think adversity, and I think uh, people that go through these tough times. In in your, like, if I could talk to a kid who's in their teens or even early twenties that is struggling with like this, like body image issues and stuff like that, and, and thinking and letting that get caught up, it's like, listen, your ability to be confident, communicate, regardless of that will will trump what you could turn your body into for sure. I mean, when, as a high schooler, I was again 163 pounds. My my two front teeth, like I people don't know this, I had braces after I left high school and they were completely turned in. So I had crooked front my two front teeth were completely turned in. So I had fucked up teeth, okay? Skinny as fuck, you could see my rib cage. I drove around a three-time hand-me-down piece of shit, you yes. know, vehicle the to work. Vehicle, right the Honda Civic. Uh, uh, I had the same thing. But right? I the raisin mobiles. And I, I for three or two and a half years of my high school career, I dated the hottest chick in the school, hands down, the prom queen, the head cheerleader. Like that was my girlfriend. And I remember being a kid, like thinking to myself, like, what the fuck is she doing with me? But I had personality. Because I had all that stuff against me, I couldn't change that. I couldn't. I could. My parents couldn't afford braces, yeah. so I was fucked up teeth. I got them. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I, I had a car that got me to and from, so it's like it's better than walking. So yeah. I, I I owned it, and I owned that 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 character and that personality. And of course, I got teased, and of course, I got made fun of, and all those things happened. But I it, it built so much thick skin in me that I never let it really bother me more. And it, and it changed my character forever. And so I know when kids are going through things like that, they, you know, you go home and you cry and you, and you, you feel so sorry for yourself about that. But it's like, you have no idea that if you can, if you can be strong, if you can yeah, make you can it, turn that on its head, you, you can. Easy. And and when you learn to do that, those characteristics will, will carry over into your adulthood and you'll surpass in, everybody in else. In fact, sometimes, sometimes, many times, 
being super buffed works against you. Oh, every right. kid that was every kid that was popular in school when I was a kid that because he was buff and his body looked great because he was a, he was a little more mature. He hit puberty in like seventh grade, uh, and so he was like kind of looking like a, he had a beard already in high yeah, school. Yeah. Like hundred percent, that kid got a ton of attention in high school and and quarter star quarterback. Mm-hmm. All of the at least in my experience, all of those dudes. Totally different position now in life. Oh my yeah. god! Well, it's totally not, different. I can one hundred percent attest to that. One hundred, yeah. right? That's it. But it's not only that. But, but you ever go to the club and you see like the dude that's like yacked, you yeah. know, he's super buffed in his shirt, but he's like obviously standing there posturing because he's super insecure about himself, and he's just kind of looking around like, hey, why aren't girls coming to talk to me? Why aren't? Right. And they and nobody wants to talk to them because. They're either they come across intimidating or weird, mm. or they just insecure. Right. You know. So. I wonder if that's still the case now. Like, is there like the buff guy? You know. Of course the, there is. That's like it's, so, it's all the attention. Dude, high school hasn't changed very much at I all. I don't know, man. I, know, I see dude. a lot of like uh, femmy dudes like walking around like getting you know a lot of attention. I'm just like, what? It's like who could be the most weird and eclectic? <laughs> and, you know, like, oh. <laughs> well, you we, know, I'm so sensitive. Well, that is a good Come point, here, girl. I, yeah. The hipster thing is much yeah. cooler now, right? So the the skinny. And the beard, and it the- might have <laughs> like, yeah, there might have been a shift there, but I'm sure it'll come back. You know, everything comes back full circle. Yeah, you're right. Next question is from Sammy June. What is good posture? How can we develop good posture, and why do most people have terrible posture? We are in the middle of seeing this get worse right yeah. now. Yeah. We're oh, creating this. Oh my god! With I our see. Patterns I day. see for the first time in my life a majority of children. Have terrible posture, isn't it crazy? That was never the case. Do you guys, before. I don't know how much yeah. you. Got. This is this is definitely like uh, after I read that book, Irresistible. Like they kind of get into this, and I remember like after reading that, like I really started like because I don't really pay attention to the seventeen year old to twenty two year old kids that are walking around stuff like that. If, my, anybody really, but it made me kind of be like, man, I wonder. Are they worse than what we were? And I start looking at all. You can see the rounded shoulders and the forward head. Really bad. Really bad. And step now, I'm used to seeing that as a trainer my whole career, right? But I normally see that on somebody who's like 40, 45, engineers, yeah. work to computers, sit at desks all day long. Well, now you have the phone. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. The phone, when you look at somebody walking and texting in, uh, on their phone and look at their posture while they're doing it yeah. and think about how much, and then you think that we are picking up our phone on average 55 times a day and we're spending over two and a half hours on it. Dude, it's poor, like its own mini gravity, just like mm-hmm. pulling them towards it. Dude, poor posture, you're you're usually not born with it, of course, unless you have some kind of uh, you know deformality or genetic you know issue. But for the most part, you're not born with it. Poor posture is developed. Mm-hmm. You develop poor posture over time, and it's scary because you do see it now in kids, whereas you never saw poor what, posture. What I will kids. say in defense of that, there are some people, and it, it runs in my family, like all of our spines are a little bit different. So I know somebody out there right now is going like, that's not true. I was diagnosed with this really early. There's certain people that are born with a, a, a structure that is less advantageous than others, right? And that's why we have some people that are more athletic. They just their structure is better than others. So yes, right. there are structures out there. I just want to clarify. Well, that's that. a good that's a good point because good posture. Uh, when people say what is good posture, it looks it, it looks a little different from yeah. person to person right. because there are differences between individuals. The other thing too, and this is going to be controversial, is does diet play a role in poor posture? Ooh. There's some evidence to suggest that it does. Hmm. There's some evidence to suggest that grain-heavy diets can cause well, uh, uh, in- increased instances of needing braces, increased instances of you know changes in people's postures and bone development. So well, why, well, why wouldn't it? Because food 100% can affect your mood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And your mood will absolutely affect your posture. That's one way. And they've got studies to to prove that and back that up. So I, there's you, one way. You would think that if somebody is eating poor and not feeling good, and then their mood turn then in turn affects their mood, and mm-hmm. if they're depressed or not, and then that affects their posture. Yeah, good posture. If if you were to define good posture, you have to look at the entire body. It's it is a snapshot. Here's the other thing, by the way. If you have good standing posture, that doesn't mean you have good function. It's just a snapshot of you standing there. Uh, you can have what looks like good posture because you practice good posture, mm. but then when the person goes to move and do things like a squat or a lunge or twist or run or walk or whatever, now they've got poor recruitment patterns. So I want to be clear, it's just one thing. For example, as a trainer, that's one thing I look at, but there's a lot of things that I look yeah. at. Well, there's less posture. favorable 
uh, patterns that we notice like that stand out, you know, immediately. And, and that's some, that those are things we like to address to see, you know, if this will eliminate a lot of, you know, the, the dysfunction, the tightness, the, the you know, the imbalances that, um, you know, create interruptions in, in the kinetic chain where it's like, you know, where the weak links are. Uh, but, you know, it's not always the case because people can really overcompensate uh, for what they've been doing pattern wise. And mm. you see this in athletics all the time. You see people like that just hone in on this, this way that they're, they're holding their body and, and stabilizing mm. their spines. So. Good, good posture is effortless, uh, effortless, meaning you're going to stand there. Things are in balance. Head is on top of your shoulders. Your feet are active. You know, your, your, your knees are, are, are soft. Um, you know, hips are where they should be. You don't have an excessive tilt uh, with your pelvis. You know, your shoulders aren't forward. They're kind of balanced, but it's effortless. Good posture shouldn't be something you think about. This if you have to think about it, that means it's not your posture. That means it's your consciously trying to stand. Right. Or, the, you know, the, the scary position. part is that, you know, a lot of the, the younger generation right now that is that is developing really poor posture early on, they're, they're not getting the signals yet that are letting them know how bad it is because the aches and pains haven't really set in. They're so young their, their bodies can handle it right now. They haven't been putting stress on it for 20, 30 years of their life. So a lot of these, the, a lot of the poor posture we see right now aren't people coming in going like, oh, I have neck pain, I have low back pain yet. But it's going to be interesting to see that. You're I, actually seeing it. You're actually seeing a rise in children with back pain, neck pain, shoulder pain. Yeah, it's crazy. You are seeing it. Which, uh, you know, kids never went to the doctor for back pain unless they hurt their back doing something. Right. But yeah. now you've got kids complaining of back pain, chronic back pain because of their posture. Well, I told you guys this one really really um uh, bothered me and it was a really tough situation on like how do I handle this because Katrina's brother his son um he couldn't even he's only let's see here he's 10 right now, 9 or 10 and uh, he couldn't sit down in a in a full mm. squat. Mm -hmm. I, he'd sit down that he was trying to admit like he, I was playing around with my little niece who's even younger and trying to teach her how to balance on one leg in a pistol squat position and she was kind of like mimic and we're having fun and he saw it and he came over and he come running over and he's like oh what are you guys doing and then he, he got down and I, he just when he went down in that position his heels came off the ground like three inches mm -hmm. and in order for him to sit in that position he couldn't sit back on his heels and I was like whoa this kid's only 10 years old already and he's losing connection. It was like the first kind of like mm -hmm. whoa moment for me that you're seeing this happen at that young of an age yeah. where you're losing something that's so functional and so basic. And then that's and what you see when you see something like that, that's the kid who in 8 years from now finds mind pump finds maps and then goes, I can't squat. Mm -hmm. You know, I can't squat. What can I do instead of squatting? Because squatting hurts my back and it's too hard for me to do. It hurts my knees. And they were just unaware they didn't have these abilities. Right. You know, they've just gone through. Yeah, he doesn't know that. Yeah. He doesn't, he, he oh, like, I didn't say, it. and that was yeah. what, what I struggle with is like, is it my place to say something or do mm -hmm. something or help him? Like, yeah. Th and, and I remember telling Katrina that, like, man, like, what do, what do I? Well, the, the that's why, you know, kinesthetic learning and in, in, in the human body, like it needs it's a it's a language like like moving and movement in itself is a language that you constantly need to be communicating with and so oh that's a great fucking line it's Justin. just you know it's just like one of those things that people like completely disregard that this is something that is is learned and needs to like keep um you know part of the education process it, it is not all cognitive what a brilliant line it, it, movement is uh, is a language that you need to practice that's brilliant it is and and i'm glad i came up with it <laughs> <laughs> you know every that, time yeah. i i don't know how you guys have been or not but you know I, I stay in contact with a lot of people that especially people that i used to train for a very long time and so you know and i still and a lot of them still listen to the show so shout out to all my my favorite clients that still tune in uh but uh, I have all of them on either Prime Pro or Prime, and much of uh, their training is is actually that even more than it is lifting weights, mm -hmm. because much of the clients that I've dealt with most of my career, yeah, they wanted to lose fifteen or twenty pounds or build a little bit of muscle. All of them just wanted to feel fucking better, and it's really changed how I coach and teach people. It's like you know what, I can teach you to build some muscle, I can teach you to burn some fat right now, but that not that's not necessarily going to get rid of that low back pain, that shoulder issue, that neck issue, that knee issue that you have going on. That's really the, the lack of movement, the poor connection that you have, 
and let me show you the things that you should be doing. So this now, and so I talk to all of them that their priority is to live in Prime and Prime Pro. And then when you have more time and you want to accelerate your goals and you want to get that extra five pounds of muscle or lose 15 pounds of fat, then we move into all the other programming. But this is, I mean, that was why we were all so excited about Prime and Prime Pro as being so revolutionary because not a lot of trainers and programmers or people that sell online programs are are really positioning themselves this way. And I, you know, I we all knew, we all knew that how important it was for even the regular clients that were training. It's going to become necessary for oh, yeah. this generation coming up that they will have to implement habits like this because the stuff you didn't they have do to think about it before that really because you know recess and in um you know more jobs had had more activity involved with well we just weren't know, looking at our careers. phone we just weren't looking at our that phone too, yeah. our phone we, we, i mean fuck the iphone's only been around for a few years really well, like, you yeah. know you know it's funny it is so, crucial now so while, while we're right. talking about this i'm looking up trying to find statistics and uh on the back pain you know neck pain rise because it's been it's already been talked about and the funny thing is I find these articles about, you know, and they acknowledge like back pain and neck pain are on the rise. Their kids going to the doctor for those things are on the rise. And they, they used to be non-existent to the point where in the past, if your kid complained of back pain or neck pain, you took them, you were supposed to, you were recommend that you take them right away to the doctor because it could mean something bad. It could mean something wrong with their kidneys or, you know, meningitis or something like that. But now they're seeing the pain. Uh, more often, that doesn't mean those things, and you know what they're saying is causing it. What they're what they're saying? Posture. No, what? backpacks. Like, uh, can you fucking believe it? Which is not. That's not what's causing it. Because uh, we all wore backpacks. Well, yeah. Here's. But it's like, it, come it on, is. guys. It is right. It is though. In their defense, it is causing it because they have poor posture and they're loading it. Sure. It's just uh, like if yeah. somebody with poor posture gets down and squat. What a great fucking point right there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That is the same thing that people that they want to address the root. That You're people that patterns. people exactly the same problem when people hurt their back or have their uh, squatting bothers them. It's because they're loading yes. a bad posture and then trying to squat. You can get away with it a lot of times with unloaded, you know, situations. Right. But yeah. Once you add that, like extra resistance to a bad uh, recruitment pattern, and then of course they blame the squat. Yeah, yeah, they blame the squat or the backpack. Exactly. Right. Exactly. That's why I meant. Why it's such a great point is that everybody blames uh, the squat. Right. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw Joe Joe Hanna's uh, post the other day. He reposted. Not Ripto. Who was it? Fuck another. Gr- who was the guy who's does, is all by uh, all unilateral stuff for his athletes? Oh uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, Mike Boyle. Mike Boyle. Thank you. So Mike, uh, he posted. Repo- Mike Boyle. Yeah, he reposted a thing about Mike Boyle and saying that you know squat. He doesn't think that squatting is necessary, and some people have different femur lengths. And I kind of responded like, well, you know, f- it's long femurs are, are not what stop people from squatting. You know, it, sure it may. Sure, I have long femurs, and I know, and for, and I can totally attest to because of that, squatting was more difficult for me, but it, it required more work. Mm-hmm. It required more. I needed way more ankle mobility than the average person because of how long my femurs are. So, yeah, okay, you could have longer, and, and that's where genetics do play a role, and structure does make it more or less challenging for certain people. It doesn't mean you eliminate a fucking movement that we learn to do before we learn to fucking walk. So, yeah, the backpack and the loaded squat and blaming backpacks or squatting. Well, it's is not exactly the same. movement, and I know Doctor Brink has been on here multiple times. and always like it's not the squat that's hurting you. You right. know, it's, it's, it's you, you, it's <laughs> yeah. you and, and you're, you know, not going through the prerequisites to perform the squat correctly and have that kind of communication established. So if, if that's, if you're somebody that's like that and you have been avoiding squats for that reason, uh, I just urge you to dive into prime pro because that is, that is a, a heavy motivator for us on why we created that program and it was created with Dr. Brink. So if you're if you are somebody who's limited from squatting, it bothers your back and so mm. you've avoided it for a long time, stop avoiding it. And that what I say stop avoiding it doesn't mean just go squat. It means go address the issues. And that's how we designed Prime Pro was to address those that teach you how to address them, how to figure it out. Like where where is your where are you not connected, and then what movements you should be doing? That was the whole idea of the program. Perfect. And a lot of these movements can be found on our YouTube channel for free. Uh, so if you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, get over there right now, Mind Pump TV. We post a new video every single day. Also, if you go to our site, mindpumpmedia.com, we have 30 days of coaching, phenomenal information. It's absolutely for free, it's for anybody. Just register and we'll send it right over to you. Thank you for listening to Mind Pump. If your goal is to build and shape your body, dramatically improve your health and energy, 
and maximize your overall performance, check out our discounted RGB Super Bundle at mindpumpmedia.com. The RGB Super Bundle includes MAPS Anabolic, MAPS Performance, and MAPS Aesthetic. Nine months of phased expert exercise programming designed by Sal, Adam, and Justin to systematically transform the way your body looks, feels, and performs. With detailed workout blueprints and over 200 videos, the RGB Super Bundle is like having Sal, Adam, and Justin as your own personal trainers, but at a fraction of the price. The RGB Super Bundle has a full 30-day money-back guarantee, and you can get it now plus other valuable free resources at mindpumpmedia.com. If you enjoy this show, please share the love by leaving us a five-star rating and review on iTunes and by introducing Mind Pump to your friends and family. We thank you for your support, and until next time, this is Mind Pump.